So our next speaker, Nature McGann, is a marine biologist, originally from Rhode Island, who specialized in reductive, reductive, sorry, reproductive physiology and developmental biology of marine invertebrates. Nature was, one, was a 2012-2014 AAAS Energy Environment and Agricultural Fellow placed at the National Science Foundation. During, which during that time, she worked on identifying opportunities for international collaboration and cooperation in Antarctica and traveled to all three U.S. Antarctic programs research stations. Now she serves as the Antarctic Research and Logistics Integration Program Manager in the Division of Polar Programs. Nature has the distinction of being the only speaker who also presented in the very first Science Policy 20 by 20. Please join me in welcoming Nature. I'm gonna do the disembodied head thing, so. <laughs> Can seem sorry. I'll stay here, it'll be fine. Okay. I have tiptoes. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard, drones are everywhere, even to Antarctica. This will be the tale of how a marine biologist ended up advising an international governing body on unmanned aircraft system safety and policy. And with just 20 seconds a slide, I promise not to drone on. <laughs> a drone by any other name. For you acronym lovers, drones are also known as UAVs, Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, UASs, Unmanned Aircraft Systems, RPASs, Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems, and for a certain class, simply as copters. The terminology differences alone complicate an already messy science policy issue. You've heard of drones shooting movies or delivering hot dogs at ball games. Amazon has even tested prime air package delivery, all illegal, by the way, under current FAA rules. Uh, but UASs are widely used for science. In Antarctica, they have or will be used for atmospheric monitoring, remote sensing of ice sheets, and for counting penguins. <laughs> NSF grantee John Cassano has launched, sometimes by hand, small UASs to gather atmospheric data. But his aircraft have also captured images of polar features like Polinia, areas of open water surrounded by sea ice that could aid navigation as well as science and are far less expensive to collect by drones than traditional aircraft. Scientists uh, from NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center use a hexacopter to image penguin and marine mammal populations. This group has taken environmental and animal safety very seriously and has developed strict operating protocols, including many training hours before even leaving the states. So UASs have many advantages over manned aircraft and even satellite systems, including lower operating costs, increased personnel safety, and reduced fossil fuel use. But there are important operational, environmental, and wildlife safety issues. So unlike location, 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 concerns are safety, safety, safety. UASs can be as serious as a bird strike to fixed wing aircraft and helicopters. Vulnerable wildlife like cute penguins uh, can be taken out by errant hobby copters. And unique Antarctic environments are at risk of contamination should a drone crash in places like the Dry Valleys or the Mount Erebus Crater. Collisions and crashes are a serious concern, not just for grooms, look for that video online, um, but also for geological sites like in our national parks. And the technology is far outpacing the policy. FAA rules are currently based on 1981 advisory for model aircraft, but are evolving as we speak. And policies bring us back to Antarctica, a continent governed by international treaty promoting peaceful and scientific uses. By presidential mandate, the NSF manages the U.S. scientific research program there and also serves on the U.S. delegation to the Antarctic Treaty. And as a policy fellow at NSF in the Division of Polar Programs, I served as an advisor to the 2014 U.S. Treaty Dell and traveled to the treaty meeting in Brazil. To say this gave me the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to say something along the lines of, Mr. Chairman, the United States of America respectfully submits this paper on blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> I was very weak. I found myself well prepared for this major international governing body meeting, having used some of my development funds to take multilateral diplomacy at the Foreign Services Institute. I found myself thinking, particularly during report language negotiation, this is just like we practiced in class. Mm. <laughs> 
Um, treaty parties share information and make policy recommendations by submitting working papers, the life cycle of which is charted here. In the case of our UAS paper, the draft was approved by our head of Dell at State. It was presented at the treaty meeting and our recommendations were adopted as written. I'm very proud of them because I actually wrote them. <laughs> um, since the technology is relatively new and rapidly advancing, uh, the US in working paper 51 recommended that scientists consider risks to the environment and wildlife and that national Antarctic program managers review the operational risks. We also suggested that the future guidelines be compatible across national programs since many of us are close neighbors in Antarctica. As it stands with our recommendations adopted, the review of the risks and safety have begun. In the meantime, scientists and national programs are planning to operate UASs this season in Antarctica, and tour operators have already adopted their own fairly conservative set of guidelines. As for the US Antarctic program, just two weeks ago, a programmatic notice was issued restricting UAV use to authorized use only by US scientists and contractors. This somewhat conservative step was taken to protect the safety of personnel, wildlife, and in the environment in the interim. This is an evolving area of policy development. Scientists and managers are expected to report back to treaty parties about risks and safety next year. And like governmental agencies worldwide, NSF is carefully considering the elements of a policy governing the use of UAS, particularly the smaller, easily accessible, more popular ones. Now, no presentation of mine these days would be complete without some gratuitous Antarctica photos. So this is me at and under the South Pole, experiences that informed my work as a fellow and would not have been possible without NSF and AAAS support. That's minus 55. <laughs> Doesn't really matter, Fahrenheit or Celsius. Uh, <laughs> Since uh, no one can deny the appeal of charismatic megafauna and icy vistas, um, I've included this, but this photo also serves as a reminder of what we are trying to protect with policies that we put in place in Antarctica, both through the US program and the treaty system. And here's a penguin, um, <laughs> mostly because it's cute, uh, but also reminds me to tell you that there are already international policies in place governing the use of traditional aircraft over and around bird and mammal populations that could be adapted in some ways for UASs, but obviously are somewhat different. Finally, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'll stick around for questions later, but I'd also like to thank my supervisor, Scott Borg, <laughs> he's over there, that's why I'm pointing that way, um, for the amazing fellowship experience and for the opportunity to keep working as a Fed temp uh, in the office of Polar, in the Division of Polar Programs. Thank you.